150 years ago, the business corporation was a relatively insignificant institution. Today, it is all pervasive, like the church, the monarchy, and the Communist Party in other times and places. The corporation is today's dominant institution. This documentary examines the nature, evolution, impacts, and possible futures of the modern business corporation. Initially given a narrow legal mandate, what has allowed today's corporation to achieve such extraordinary power and influence over our lives? We begin our inquiry as scandals threaten to trigger a wide debate about the lack of public control over big corporations. I don't think there is um, an overhang uh, over the market of distrust. Listen, 95% or some percent, huge percentage of the business community are honest and uh, reveal all their assets. And got compensation programs that are balanced, and, uh, but there are some bad acts. The media debate about the basic operating principles of the corporate world was quickly reduced to a game of follow the leader. I still happen to think the United States is the greatest place in the world to invest. We have some shakeups that are going on because of a few bad apples. Some people call me a bad apple. Well, I may be bruised, but I still taste sweet. Some people call me a bad apple, but I may be the sweetest apple on the tree. These are not just a bunch of bad apples. This is just a few bad apples. It's not just a few bad apples. We've got to get rid of the bad apples. You can start with Tyco. Bad apples. We know all about WorldCom. Bad apples. Xerox Corporation. Bad apples. Arthur Anderson. Bad apples. Enron, obviously. Bad apples. Kmart Corporation. The fruit cart is getting uh, a little more full. I don't think it's just a few apples, unfortunately. I think this is the worst crisis of confidence in uh, business. What's wrong with this picture? Can't we pick a better metaphor to describe the dominant institution of our time? Through the voices of CEOs, whistleblowers, brokers, gurus and spies, insiders and outsiders, we present the corporation as a paradox, an institution that creates great wealth but causes enormous and often hidden harms. I see the corporation as part of a jigsaw in society as a whole, which if you remove it, the picture's incomplete. But equally, if it's the only part, it's not going to work. A sports team. Some of us are blocking and tackling, some of us are running the ball, some of us are throwing the ball. But we all have a common purpose, which is to succeed as an organization. A corporation is like a family unit. People in a corporation work together for a common end. Like the telephone system, it reaches almost everywhere. It's extraordinarily powerful. It's pretty hard to avoid. And it transforms the lives of people, I think, on balance for the better. The eagle, soaring, clear-eyed, competitive, prepared to strike, but not a vulture. Noble, uh, visionary, majestic, that people can believe in and be inspired by, that creates such a lift that it soars. I could see that being a good logo for the principal company. <laughs> OK, guys, enough bullshit. Corporations are artificial creations. You might say they're monsters trying to devour as much profit as possible uh, at anyone's expense. I think of a whale, gentle, big fish, which could swallow you in an instant. Dr. Frankenstein's creation has overwhelmed and overpowered him as the corporate form has done with us.
The word corporate gets attached in, in almost, you know, in a pejorative sense to, and gets married with the word agenda. And one hears a lot about the corporate agenda as though it is evil, as though it is an agenda which is trying to take over the world. Personally, I don't use the word corporation. I use the word business. I will use the word, use the word uh, uh, company. I'll use the words business community. Because I think that is a much fairer representation than zeroing in on just this word corporation. What is a corporation? It's funny that I've taught in a business school for as long as I have without ever having been asked uh, so, so pointedly to say what I think a corporation is. It is one form of business ownership. It's a group of individuals working together to serve a variety of objectives, the principal one of which is earning large, growing, sustained, legal returns for the people who own the business. The modern corporation has grown out of the industrial age. The industrial age began in 1712, when an Englishman named Thomas Newcomen invented a steam-driven pump to pump water out of the English coal mine so the English coal miners could get it more coal to mine rather than hauling buckets of water out of the mine. It was all about productivity, more coal per man hour. That was the dawn of the industrial age. And then it became more steel per man hour, more textiles per man hour, more automobiles per man hour. And today, it's more chips per man hour, more gizmos per man hour. The system is basically the same, producing more sophisticated products today. The dominant role of corporations in uh, our lives is essentially a product of the roughly the past century. Corporations were originally associations of people who were chartered by a state to perform some particular function, like a group of people want to build a bridge over the Charles River or something like that. There were very few chartered corporations in early United States history. And the ones that existed had clear stipulations in their state-issued charters how long they could operate, the amount of capitalization, uh, what they made or did or maintained a turnpike, whatever, was in their charter, and they didn't do anything else. They didn't own or couldn't own another corporation. Uh, their shareholders were liable, and so on. In l both law and the culture, the corporation was considered a subordinate entity that was a gift from the people in order to serve the public good. So you have that history, and we shouldn't be misled by it. It's not as if those were the halcyon days when all corporations served the public trust. But there's a lot to learn from that. The Civil War and the Industrial Revolution created enormous growth in corporations. And so there was an explosion of railroads who got large federal subsidies of land, banking, heavy manufacturing, and corporate lawyers a century and a half ago realized they needed more power to operate and wanted to remove some of the constraints that had historically been placed on the corporate form. The 14th Amendment was passed at the end of the Civil War to give equal rights to black people. And therefore, it, it said no state can deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And that was intended to prevent the states from taking away life, liberty, or property from black people, as they had done uh, for so much of our history. And what happens is the corporations come into court, and corporation lawyers are very clever, and they say, oh, you can't deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. We are a person. A corporation is a person. And the Supreme Court goes along with that. And what was particularly grotesque about this was that the 14th Amendment was passed to protect newly freed slaves. 
So, for instance, between uh, 1890 and 1910, there were 307 cases brought before the court under the 14th Amendment. 288 of these brought by corporations, 19 by African Americans. Six hundred thousand people were killed to get rights for people. And then with strokes of the pen over the next 30 years, judges applied those rights to capital and property while stripping them from people. Everybody makes a mistake once in a while, but I just can't be personally responsible. That's one of the weaknesses of a partnership, isn't it, Sid? Well, maybe you'd better incorporate the store. Incorporate? Yes. Incorporating would give you the big advantage of what you want right now. Limited liability. You start with a group of people who want to invest their money in a company. Then these people apply for a charter as a corporation. This government issues a charter to that corporation. Now that corporation operates legally as an individual person. It is not a group of people. It is under the law a legal person. Imperial Steel Incorporated has many of the legal rights of a person. It can buy and sell property. It can borrow money. It can sue in court and be sued. It carries on a business. Imperial Steel, along with thousands of other legal persons, is a part of our daily living. It is a member of our society. Having acquired the legal rights and protections of a person, the question arises, what kind of person is the corporation? Corporations were given the rights of immortal persons, but then special kinds of persons, persons who have no moral conscience. These are a special kind of persons which are designed by law to be concerned only for their stockholders and not, say, what are sometimes called their stakeholders, like the community or the workforce or whatever. The great problem of having corporate citizens is that they aren't like the rest of us. As Baron Thurlow in England is supposed to have said, they have no soul to save and they have no body to incarcerate. I believe the mistake that a lot of people make when they think about corporations is they, th they think, you know, corporations are like us. General Electric is a kind old man with lots of stories. Nike. Young. Energetic. Microsoft. Aggressive. McDonald's. Young, outgoing, uh, enthusiastic. Monsanto. Immaculately dressed. Disney. Goofy. The Body Shop. Uh, deceptive. Very lovely. <laughs> Do you know what The Body Shop is? No. <laughs> they think they have feelings, they have politics, they have belief systems. They really only have one thing, the bottom line. How to make as much money as they can in any given quarter. That's it. Of course they make a profit. And it's a good thing. That's the incentive that makes capitalism work to give us more of the things that we need. That's the incentive that other economic systems lack. People accuse us of only paying attention to the, the economic leg because they think that's what a business person's mindset is. It's just money. And it's not so because we as business people know that we need to certainly address the environment, but also we, we need to be seen as constructive members of, of society. There are companies that, that do good for the communities. They, they produce services and goods that are of value to all of us that make our lives better, and that's a good thing. The problem comes in, in the profit motivation here, because these people, there's no such thing as enough. And I always counter point out there's no organization on this planet that can neglect its economic foundation. Even someone 
you know, living under a banyan tree is dependent on, on support from someone. The economic lag has to be addressed by everyone. It's not just a business issue. But unlike someone under a banyan tree, all publicly traded corporations have been structured through a series of legal decisions to have a peculiar and disturbing characteristic. They are required by law to place the financial interests of their owners above competing interests. In fact, the corporation is legally bound to put its bottom line ahead of everything else, even the public good. That's not a law of nature. That's a very specific decision, in fact, the judicial decision. Uh, so they're concerned only for the short-term profit of their stockholders, who are very highly concentrated. To whom do these companies owe um, loyalty? What does loyalty mean? Well, it, it turns out that that was a rather naive concept anyway, as corporations are always owed obligation to themselves to get large and to get profitable. In doing this, it tends to be more profitable to the extent it can make pe other people pay the bills for its impact on society. There's a terrible word that economists use for this called externalities. An externality is, a, is the effect of a transaction between two individuals and a third party who has not consented to or played any role in the carrying out of that transaction. And there are real problems in that area, there's no doubt about it. Running a business is a tough proposition. There are costs to be minimized at every turn. And at some point, the corporation says, you know, let somebody else deal with that. Let's let somebody else supplant the military power to the Middle East to protect the oil at its source. Let's let somebody else build the roads that we can drive these automobiles on. Let's let somebody else have those problems. And that is where externalities come from, that notion of let somebody else deal with that. I got all I can handle myself. A corporation is an externalizing machine in the same way that a shark is a killing machine. Each one is designed in a very efficient way to accomplish particular objectives. In the achievement of those objectives, uh, there isn't any question of malevolence or of will. The enterprise has within it, and the shark has within it, those characteristics that enable it to do that for which it was designed. So the pressure's on the corporation to deliver results now and to externalize any cost that this unwary or uncaring public will allow it to externalize. To determine the kind of personality that drives the corporation to behave like an externalizing machine, we can analyze it like a psychiatrist would a patient. We can even formulate a diagnosis on the basis of typical case histories of harm it has inflicted on others, selected from a universe of corporate activity. Well, this is the office of the National Labor Committee here in the garment area of New York City. It's a little bit uh, disheveled. These are all uh, from different campaigns. To make this stuff concrete as possible, we purchase all of the products from the, the factories that we're talking about. This shirt sells for $14.99, and the women who made the shirt got paid three cents. Liz Claiborne jackets made in El Salvador. The jackets are $178, and the workers were paid 74 cents for every jacket they made. Alpine cost stereos, 31 cents an hour. It's not just sneakers, it's not just apparel, it's, it's everything. We were in Honduras, and some workers, they knew the kind of work we did, and they approached us, these young workers, and they said, uh, conditions in our factory are horrible. Will you please meet with us? 
And we said we would, but you can't meet in the developing world. You can't walk up to a factory with your notebook and workers come out, interview them. I mean, there's goons, there's spies, the military police. So you do everything in a clandestine manner. We're about to start the meeting, and in walk three guys, very tough looking guys. The company had found out about our meeting and sent these spies. Obviously, uh, we didn't have the meeting, but these young girls were really bright. And as they were leaving, away from the eyesight of the spies, they started to put their hands underneath the table. And I put my palm under there, I put my hand under there, and they put into my, my hand their pay stubs. So we'd know who they were, what they were paid, and the labels that they made in the factory so we'd know who they worked for. And I took my hand out after everyone had left, and in the palm of my hand was the face of Kathy Lee Gifford. But the bottom of it is the, the interesting part. A portion of the proceeds from the sale of this garment will be donated to various children's charities. It's very touching. Get your right here. Walmart is telling you if you purchase these pants, and Kathy Lee is telling you if you purchase these pants, you're going to help children. The problem was the people who handed us the label were 13 years of age. Do many people have family work? Yes, sir. Just me. You support. How many people do you support? Eight people. Eight people. Yeah. And how do you do with that salary? Is it enough? Let's look at it from a, a, a different point of view. Let's look at it from the point of view of the, the uh, people in Bangladesh who are starving to death, the people in China who are starving to death, and the only thing that they have to offer to anybody that is worth anything is their low-cost labor. And in effect, what they are saying to the world is they have this big flag that says, come over and hire us. We will work for 10 cents an hour because 10 cents an hour will buy us the rice that we need not to starve. And come and rescue us from our circumstance. And so when Nike comes in, they are regarded by everybody in the community as an enormous godsend. It's always wide no, open. No, 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 no. That's my clothes. Hey, you Those are my clothes. No, this is not your clothes. Where's your camera? Let's look. Don't touch the woman. Okay, why? Okay. This is a private company. Yes. Without permission, how can you come here? Uh-huh. Huh. Well, the door was wide open, and, uh... The only door I go open your throat, though, the employees, not for you. We went through the garbage dump in the Dominican Republic. We always do this kind of stuff. We dig around. One day, we found a big pile of Nike's internal pricing documents. Nike assigns a time frame to each operation. They don't talk about minutes. They break the time frame into ten thousandths of a second. You get to the bottom of all 22 operations to give the workers 6.6 .6 minutes to make the shirt. It's 70 cents an hour in the Dominican Republic. That 6.6 .6 minutes equals 8 cents. These are Nike's documents. That means the wages come to 3 tenths of 1% of the retail price. This is the reality. It's the science of exploitation. What happens in the areas where these corporations go in and are successful? They soon find that they can't do any more in that country because the wages are too high now. And what's that another way of saying? Well, the people are no longer desperate. So, okay, we've used up all the desperate people there. They're all plump and healthy and wealthy. Let's move on to the next desperate lot and employ them and raise their level up. Well, the whole idea of the export processing zone is that it will be the first step towards this wonderful new development. Through the investment that's attracted to these countries, there will be a trickle-down effect into the communities. But because so many countries are now in the game of creating these free trade enclaves, they have to keep providing more and more incentives for companies to come to their little denationalized pocket, um, and that the, the tax holidays get longer. So the workers rarely make enough money to buy three meals a day, let alone feed their local economy.
something happened in 1940 which marked the beginning of a new era, the era of the ability to synthesize and create on an unlimited scale new chemicals that had never existed before in the world. And using the magic of research, oil companies compete with each other in taking the petroleum molecule apart and rearranging it into, well, you name it. So suddenly, it became possible to produce any new chemicals, synthetic chemicals, the likes of which had never existed before in the world, for any purpose and at virtually no cost. Fabrics, toothbrushes, tires, insecticides, cosmetics, weed killers, a whole galaxy of things to make a better life on Earth. For instance, if you wanted to go to a chemist and say, look, I want to have a chemical, say a pesticide, which will persist throughout the food chain, and I don't want it to have to renew it uh, very, very often. I'd like it to be relatively non-destructible. And then he'd put two benzene molecules on the blackboard and add a chlorine here and a chlorine that, and th that was DDT. When the 8th Army needed Jap civilians to help them out in our occupation, they called on native doctors to administer DDT under the supervision of our men to stem a potential typhus epidemic. Dusting like this goes a long way in checking disease, <laughs> and the laughs are them. Pardon our dust. As the petrochemical era grew and grew, warning signs emerged that some of these chemicals could pose hazards. The data initially were trivial, anecdotal, but gradually a body of data started accumulating to the extent that we now know that the synthetic chemicals which have permeated our workplace our consumer products, our air, our water, produce cancer and also birth defects and some other toxic effects. Furthermore, industry has known about this, at least most industries have known about this, and have attempted to trivialize these risks. If I take a gun and shoot you, that's criminal. If I expose you to some chemicals which knowingly are going to kill you, what difference is there? The difference is that it takes longer to kill you. We are now in the midst of a major cancer epidemic, and I have no doubt, and I have documented the basis for this, that industry is largely responsible for this overwhelming epidemic of cancer, in which one in every two men get cancer in their lifetimes, and one in every three women get cancer in their lifetimes. Towards the end of 1989, a great box of documents arrived at my office without any indication where they came from. And I opened them and um, found in it a complete set of Monsanto files, particularly a set of files dealing with toxicological testing of cows who have been given RBGH. BST, trade name Posilac, is being used in more than a quarter of the dairy herds in the United States, according to Monsanto. The milk has been drunk by a large portion of the American population since the Food and Drug Administration declared it safe for both cows and humans four years and ago. And at that time, Monsanto was saying, there's no evidence whatsoever of any ad adverse effects, we don't use antibiotics, and this clearly showed that they had lied through their teeth. <laughs> The 
files described areas of chronic inflammation in the heart, lung, kidney, spleen, also reproductive effects, also a whole series of other problems. It's the most comprehensive independent assessment of the drug concludes that BST results in unnecessary pain, suffering and distress for the cows. This is not acceptable for a drug designed simply to increase milk production. It is a silly product. We have a, the industrial world is a wash in milk. We're overproducing milk. We are actually have governments around the world who pay farmers not to produce milk. So the first product Monsanto comes up with is a product that produces more of what we don't need. Of course, you'll want to inject Pozolac to every eligible cow, as each cow not treated is a lost income opportunity. But the problem was that use of the artificial hormone caused all kinds of problems for the cows. It caused something called mastitis, uh, which is a very painful uh, infection of the udders. When you milk the cow, if the cow has bad mastitis, some of the, and I don't know how to say this in a, you know, I hope people aren't watching at dinner time, but the pus from the infection of the udders ends up in the milk, and the somatic cell count, they call it, the bacteria count inside your milk goes up. There's a cost to the cows. Uh, the cows get sicker when they're injected with RBGH. They're injected with antibiotics. We know that people are consuming antibiotics through their food. And we know that that's contributing to antibiotic resistant bacteria and diseases. And we know we're at a crisis when somebody can go into a hospital and get a staph infection and it can't be cured and they die. That's a crisis. Bad for the cow, bad for the farmer, bad potentially for the consumer. The jury is out. We see a lot of conflicting evidence about potential health risks. And of course, as a consumer, my belief is, why should I take any risk? Factory farm cows have not been the only victims of Monsanto products. Large areas of Vietnam were deforested by the US military using Monsanto's Agent Orange. The toxic herbicide reportedly caused over 50,000 birth defects, as well as hundreds of thousands of cancers in Vietnamese civilians and soldiers, and in former American troops serving in Southeast Asia. Unlike the Vietnamese victims, U.S. Vietnam veterans exposed to Agent Orange were able to sue Monsanto for causing their illnesses. Monsanto settled out of court, paying $80 million in damages, but it never admitted guilt. Sleeping in a motel in Brewer, Maine one night, I woke up with terrible hay fever and my eyes were burning and I looked out of the river and there were great mounds of white foam going right down the river. And the next morning I got up and I said, my God, what was that happening last night? He said, oh, that's just the river. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, look, every night the paper companies send this stuff down the river. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, don't you understand? That's how we get rid of the effluent from the paper mills. Well, I knew at that time, I'd been in a business, I'd sold um, oil to the paper mills, I knew all the owners, I'd been in politics, I knew the people in the towns. I knew not one constituent of the paper mills wanted to have the river polluted. And yet here the river was being polluted. And it was more or less as if we created a doom machine. In our search for wealth and, and for prosperity, we created something that was gonna destroy us. The traders who are involved in the market are not guys whose moral fiber when it comes to environmental conditions are gonna be, be rattled at all. They're seeing dollars and they're making money. Brokers don't stay away from copper because it, it violates their religious beliefs or their environmental policies, no. When you think about it, but <laughs> it's fleeting. <laughs> it really is a fleeting moment, it's like, you know, yeah, oh yeah, well, the town's being polluted down there in Peru, but uh, hey, this guy needs to buy some copper. I'm getting paid a commission, too. Our information that we receive does not include anything about the environmental conditions. 
because un until the environmental conditions become a commodity themselves or being traded, then obviously we will not have anything to do with that. It doesn't come into our psyche at all. You know, it, it's so far away and it's, it, you hardly hear anything about it. I mean, keep in mind, I mean, there are things going on right in our backyard, for God's sake. We trade live hogs. I mean, there's so many pigs in the state of Carolina that is polluting the rivers, but how often do you find out about that? At Multinational Monitor, we put together a list of the top corporate criminals of the 1990s. We went back and looked at all of the criminal fines that corporations had paid in the decade. Exxon pled guilty in connection to federal criminal charges with the Valdez spill and paid $125 million in criminal fines. General Electric was guilty of defrauding the federal government and paid $9.5 million in criminal fines. Chevron was guilty of environmental violations and paid $6.5 million in Mitsubishi fines. Mitsubishi was guilty of antitrust violations and paid $1.8 million in fines. IBM was guilty of illegal exports and paid $8.5 million in was guilty of, criminal of fines. environmental violations. Pfizer, and paid the $1 drug manufacturer, in was guilty of antitrust of violations Dwalla and was paid guilty $20 million of food fines. and drug regulatory violations. Sears was guilty of financial fraud. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. Unical was guilty of fraud. Environmental violations. Korean Airlines. Gas tax. 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 Gas Again and again, we have the problem that whether you obey the law or not is a matter whether it's cost effective. If the chance of getting caught and the penalty are less than it costs to comply, uh, people think of it as being just a business decision. I'm drawing the metaphor of the early attempts to fly. The man going off of a very high cliff in his airplane with the wings flapping and the guys flapping the wings and the wind is in his face and this poor fool thinks he's flying but in fact he's in free fall and he just doesn't know it yet because the ground is so far away. But of course the craft is doomed to crash. That's the way our civilization is. The very high cliff represents the virtually unlimited resources we seem to have when we began this journey. The craft isn't flying because it's not built according to the laws of aerodynamics, and it's subject to the law of gravity. Our civilization is not flying because it's not built according to the laws of aerodynamics for civilizations that would fly. And of course, the ground is still a long way away, but some people have seen that ground rushing up sooner than the rest of us have. The visionaries have seen it and have told us it's coming. There's not a single scientific peer-reviewed paper published in the last 25 years that would contradict this scenario. Every living system of Earth is in decline. Every life support system of Earth is in decline. And these together constitute the biosphere, the biosphere that supports and nurtures all of life, and not just our life, but perhaps 30 million other species that share this planet with us. The typical company of the 20th century, extractive, wasteful, abusive, linear in all of its processes, taking from the earth, making, wasting, sending its products back to the biosphere, waste to a landfill. I myself was amazed to learn just how much stuff the Earth has to produce through our extraction process to produce a dollar of revenue for our company. When I learned, I was flabbergasted. We're leaving a terrible legacy of poison and diminishment of the environment for our grandchildren's grandchildren. Generations not yet born. 
some people have called that intergenerational tyranny, a form of taxation without representation levied by us, some generations yet to be. It's the wrong thing to do. One of the questions that comes up periodically is to what extent could a corporation be uh, considered to be a uh, psychopathic? And if we look at a corporation as a legal person, that it may not be that difficult to actually draw the transition between psychopathy in the individual to psychopathy in, in a corporation. We can go through the characteristics that define this particular disorder uh, one by one and see how they might apply to corporations. They would have all the characteristics. And in fact, in many respects, a corporation of that sort is a prototypical psychopath. If the dominant institution of our time has been created in the image of a psychopath, who bears the moral responsibility for its actions? Can a building have moral opinions? Can a building have social responsibility? If a building can't have social responsibility, what does it mean to say that a corporation can? A corporation is simply a artificial legal structure. But the people who are engaged in it, whether the stockholders, whether the executives in it, whether the employees, they all have moral responsibilities. It's a fair assumption that every human being real human beings, flesh and blood ones, not corporations. But every flesh and blood human being is a moral person. You know, we've got the same genes, we're more or less the same. Uh, but our, uh, you know, our nature, the nature of humans, allows all kinds of behavior. I mean, I, every one of us under some circumstances could be, uh, you know, a, a gas chamber attendant and a saint. No job in my experience with Goodyear has been as frustrating as the CEO job. Because even though the perception is that you have absolute power to do whatever you want, the reality is you don't have that power. Sometimes, if you had really a free hand, if you really did what you wanted to do that suits your personal uh, thoughts and your personal priorities, you'd act differently. But as a CEO, you cannot do that. Layoffs have become so widespread that people tend to believe that CEOs make these decisions without any consideration to the human implications of their decisions. It is never a decision that any CEO makes lightly. It is a tough decision. Um, but it is uh, the consequence of modern capitalism. When you look at a corporation, just like when you look at a slave owner, uh, you want to distinguish between the institution and the individual. So uh, slavery, for example, or other forms of tyranny are inherently monstrous. But the individuals participating in them may be the nicest guys you can imagine. Benevolent, friendly, nice to their children, even nice to their slaves, uh, caring about um, other people. I mean, as individuals, they may be anything. Uh, the, as in, in their institutional role, they're monsters because the, the institution's monsters. And the same is true here. My wife and I, some years ago, had a, at our home a demonstration. Uh, Twenty-five people arrived. They hung a big banner on the top of our house saying murderers. They danced around outside in gas masks and so on. Yeah, how are you? Oh, my name's John. How are John. you? Well, you're not looking at me when you say it. You have to be a little bit careful because I'm very sensitive to uh, oh, people okay. that are not friendly. Hello, hello. Okay. Did you notice you being re recorded and felt? No, I didn't. No. Well, I think well, you'll see yourself on television. No, it'd be polite to mention, wouldn't it? I mean, here we are. I mean, not... politeness? They could have done it. This is a corporation which is funding directly police, which this corporation has admitted. So who is a corporation? A corporation, a corporation is an organisation of individuals, and this individual is part of that corporation. So he's As a public demonstration, it wasn't very effective. There were only two. This is a very rural area, two people and a dog, and it's not a very big house, which I think rather surprised them. But then we sat down and talked to them, 
for a couple of hours and you know we gave them tea and coffee and they had lunch on our lawn sorry, well, there's another coffee coming there's, uh, there's no who wants it? Uh, sorry about the soya anyway <laughs> no need for you to be deceitful why didn't you just ask me whether i was in Hello, oh. can we have a murderous panel <laughs> <laughs> after about 20 minutes they said well, the problem's not you, you know, it's Shell. So I said, no, wait a minute, let's uh, talk about what is Shell. You know, it's made up of people like me. In the end, what we found in that discussion was all the things that they were worried about, I was worried about as well. Climate, you know, oppressive regimes, human rights. The big difference between us was I feel that I actually can make a contribution to this. These people were frustrated because they felt they had no, nothing to do. So an individual CEO, let's say, may really care about the environment. And in fact, since they have such extraordinary resources, they can even devote some of their resources to that without violating their responsibility to be totally inhuman. Which is why, as the Moody Stewart serve tea to protesters, Shell Nigeria can flare unrivaled amounts of gas, making it one of the world's single worst sources of pollution. And all the professed concerns about the environment do not spare Ken Sarawiwa and eight other activists from being hanged for opposing Shell's environmental practices in the Niger Delta.